This week in games, Apex Legend developer faces layoffs, PlayStation VR 2 is no longer in production, and we get the cast of the Among Us TV show. This is the Two Penny Games cast. What's poppin' players? Welcome back to the Two Penny Games Cast, episode 191. I am your host, Tavin Bothel, here with my good friend and co-host, say hello to the people, Connor Elliott. How are you guys doing this wonderful Monday evening? Huh? Monday evening, indeed. About six, about 6.45 on a Monday evening, twitch.tv slash Two Penny Games. We have finally gone live, in which we record all of our podcasts. That's right. The Two Penny Games Cast reviews the Two Penny Game Club or the Piggy Bank, all recorded Monday, twitch.tv slash Two Penny Games. I don't know, about 6, 6.30, depending on whenever I can get home. You know? Traffic. It sucks. I hate it. Anyways. You gotta wait on him each and every single week. Whatever. You was in your room playing more Final Fantasy VII. You were fine. You were in your element. I was. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And who set up the show today? Me and you last night. Well, there's that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But, you know, I put all the figures in here and I turned the lights on. That's and, true. That's true. You know, I got it all logged in and stuff. It, it was a good time. It was a good time. No. Connor, how's your week been, friend? It's been good. Yeah. Yeah. I'll say that's good. We'll say it's good. Yeah. Yeah. Gaming, working. Yeah. You know, the nine to five. I'll tell you, I'll tell you what. You had your boys over on Saturday like you often Yeah. Do. Yeah. They got me fucked up. You got yourself fucked up, Tevin. You only have yourself to blame. No. Well, I mean, you know, they were suggestive. Somebody said, hey, let's do a shot. And I was like, you know, I get, I, you know, I'm fine. I'll do a shot. I get a little buzz. It's fine. Somebody, and then, you know, it was another one and another one. And then, and then next thing I know, I'm fucking, uh, I got a headache in the morning. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. to, I was sick as, I was sick as a dog the <laughs> next morning, bro. Hung over as hell. But, ladies and gentlemen, you're not here to listen to all of that. You're here for the new news you need to know. That's because this is the Two Penny Games cast. Each week, me and Connor come to you with two topics, two pennies, if you will, and we give you our two cents on them. This week, Connor, we got a little bit of... What are you doing? What are you, do, what are you <laughs> well, playing with? What are you doing over here? Well, my hand disappears, and so I was like, I never noticed that before, and I was doing the little... You know, the little, little action, little uh, trigger finger, you know? I don't know how to train. I don't, the next, the first story is a very serious story. I don't know how to. I don't know how to how to transition into it. So I guess I guess we're just gonna go. All right. I guess we're just gonna jump into our first topic of the day, Connor. Your first penny of the day, and uh, it's not the most fun one in the world. But let's uh, let's 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 talk about it again. Yep. Uh, pretty much, uh, it's become a common occurrence on this show every Monday for our first story, because we always talk about the people in the video game industry, uh, and those people are always being laid off. And so from IGN, Respawn hit by 23 layoffs amid EA's ongoing cuts, with Apex Legends among the games impacted. This is from Cat Bailey. Around two dozen Respawn employees have been laid off, part of a series of ongoing cuts at EA that will ultimately see around 5% of the company's workers lose their jobs. Reports of the layoffs began circulating on social media on Thursday, with Apex Legends' social team among the areas impacted. IGN understands that these layoffs are part of the reductions announced in February that will impact around 670 workers. The layoffs are expected to be completed by the end of the month. EA's reasoning for the layoffs was that it was pivoting away from future licensed IP to its own franchises, making the Apex Legends layoff somewhat surprising. Nevertheless, IGN understands that EA plans to continue investing in the development of Apex Legends going forward, with a source with, a source with knowledge of EA's plans insisting that it's still a, quote, huge priority for the future. And then... And then we also have... Over at Wordsong, Dev, Something Wicked reportedly lays off majority of staff. This is from uh, Justin Carter over, over at GameDeveloper.com. Mass layoffs have allegedly taken place at Something Wicked Games. Over the weekend, senior animator Eric Webb claimed the studio laid off most of our staff. Programmer Andrew uh, Wallosin and writer Jessica Silwinski confirmed they were among those affected. 
Quote, even though it was short, I was lucky to work with such extremely talented people, wrote the former. There we go. Um, so yeah, more layoffs, more problems. Uh, it just, it's not going to stop and it, it and it, 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 the industry is in trouble right now. We've talked about this before. I think I missed the episode where EA announced all of their layoffs and how they're going to move away from, uh, uh, known IPs and so forth or, and licensed IPs. I don't understand that strategy personally. Um, I would assume the, the Jedi games are selling well, uh, and you know, it's unfortunate that, you know, uh, Respawn's first-person shooter game got canceled. We just can't, after we just talked about it being a Mandalorian game and being excited for it and so forth, uh, it's just unfortunate, man. It, it, that, that one really bummed me out. So um, <clears throat> to see this talent go from Respawn is upsetting because I, 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 for my bottom dollar, Respawn is probably a top 10 developer right now. Uh, maybe even top five, depending on how you want to cut it. Like, Respawn has been on they shit f since Titanfall 1, you mm -hmm. know, and they've, they've just been killing the game ever since. And, you know, Apex Legends is huge. Um, that that That's my my biggest question about that is, is like, okay, you give Respawn the, this huge IP with Star Wars. You make them your Star Wars studio. You... Um, have them run your biggest game of service and one of the biggest games of service games out there with Apex Legends and it's still not enough bro what did what else did you need cuz uh, Jedi Fallen Order sold like hotcakes uh i assume Jedi Survivor did pretty well as well you know um so it's just confusing to me to where they see that and they think oh we need to move away from the licensed IPs now Maybe they look at things such as a Marvel's Avengers and see that flop, a Marvel's Midnight Suns, see that not really perform up to standard of a normal Marvel video game or, or anything. Um, all the current DC uh, games that have flopped being Gotham Knights, Suicide Squad killed the Justice League, um, all of these things. And maybe Jedi Survivor didn't hit a certain level that they wanted to. You also have to assume, I guess, Star Wars Squadrons might be a a, a a bullet point in that note as well. But, like, what were your expectations for these games? Uh, you look at Battlefront 2, the, the, uh, the 2019, 18, 17? 2015 was Battlefront 1. I think 2017 was Battlefront 2. And then they, they made it... No, it couldn't have been 2017. It had to have been maybe 2018. Um, it was... But 2017. Any, 2017, that's what I thought. Um, but any perceived issue with Battlefront 2, I would assume would fall on publisher side because the devs made it's a good game. You know, it's just it was forced in all these microtransactions and business things that made it be a big controversy. So I don't know where EA's perspective on how licensed IP aren't selling anymore, especially when you look at Spider Man. Spider-Man 2 being uh, Sony's fastest-selling exclusive title ever, uh, selling, you know, 10 million within just a few months. Like, that's insane. Um, so, yeah, I don't, I, I don't understand that perspective, and it sucks that now Respawn has to face the brunt of these decisions. Yeah, and, you know, I remember it was a while ago, maybe two years ago, we covered a story of how uh, Respawn uh, was one of the few companies that wasn't making workers crunch. They had a certain way that they conducted how they made Apex Legends, and so they really came across as one of the better uh, game developers in the business because they didn't uh, cause a problem that's pretty rampant throughout the industry. But clearly they're not immune to these layoffs that we've been seeing, and if they're suffering, I feel like we're going to see, you know, of course we already knew we were going to see a lot more layoffs. We've been talking about in the, uh, in the past how... Uh, studios are going to start closing down as well. At least that's what some experts have said. And every single week, we kind of see the crawl towards that. And, you know, who's going to be next? You know, you can just throw a dart at a board and probably get some uh, you know, accurate answer of who it's going to be at some point this year. Yeah. Um, and then uh, the Something Wicked games. Mm -hmm. uh, th this is, I mean, this is tough. Something Wicked, uh, it, I believe, is that... Uh, sort of like stop motion animated game, right? That that was premiered. 
I want to say to I want to say to PlayStation Showcase. Does that sound correct, Connor? Do you, do you not the remember? Bayou game, right? Is it not? I thought it was. Um, that's what, that's what I was confused. Let me about. let me double check this article and let me see if they say something. Uh, founded mid twenty two. All three previous they worked on Bethesda. Late last year, blah 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 blah. Word was song. a twelve person team at work on the RPG. Yeah, word song. I don't know. These aren't. Uh, we didn't really seem to get anything substantial from this game. Oh, yes. word song. De- oh, word song. Oh, okay. I'm I'm on the wrong. I'm on the wrong game. Mm-hmm. Then. All right. Well, I mean. Majority of a twelve-person staff. That sucks to be. To, I mean, it, it. It. It's hard to be the little guy right now. Mm-hmm. Um, the big guys aren't doing good. Yeah, the big guys aren't doing good. So it's. It, it's really hard to be a little guy. It's really hard to find a publisher. It's really hard to keep the boat afloat right now. It's. It. It like the, this industry is more volatile than ever before, and and I, like. You just got to think of all the talent we're losing. You know, a bunch of people who go, it's just not worth it anymore. You know, like I, I got, I put my heart and my soul into this, and I've only uh, uh, received this like uh, uh, backlash. I want to call it, but that's the wrong word. Getting I, shafted. I, yeah, basically, I've just gotten screwed over by by working in this industry. So now it's it's just time to move on. Um, <clears throat> so it, it it just sucks seeing and knowing that all of our all of our future. Um, talent that could have produced amazing games is now going to be lost to time and who knows who knows like we really do not see the the overarching effects of all of these things quite yet it's going to be another five years where we're going to be looking around and going yo why are all these games kind of mid or whatever or you know like why why aren't there as many as there used to be in in this that and the third and it's because of it's because of this you know because the industry hurts so hopefully these artists persevere and hopefully they find uh find their footing somewhere um where they are happy connor moving on to our second topic of the day my first penny of the day sony reportedly halts psvr2 production as headset fails to sell this is from kenneth shepherd over at kotaku The PlayStation VR 2 is struggling, it seems. According to a March 17th Bloomberg report, Sony has paused uh, of the... Sony has paused of the PS5's virtual reality headset after its initial supply has failed to pick up sales momentum, resulting in an overflow of unsold stock. Bloomberg states that Sony has produced five... uh, Excuse me. Has produced two million PSVR headsets since the device's launch in February 2023, with sales consistently declining each quarter. According to the International Data Corporation, this is in line with a January 2023 Bloomberg report of a rough start for Sony's headset. Even before the PSVR 2 was out, Sony was reportedly struggling to meet its own pre-order expectations, through, uh, though the company later denied this. So, PSVR 2, I mean, it's it's been on the struggle bus ever since it came out. There's no software to sell the hardware. That's the biggest problem. Um, we recently covered a story about how they're trying to get it to work with PCs, um, and I think that's smart, but I think, you know, then there was rumors that came out that it was, it's less about finding a base for the PSVR 2 and more of just selling the stock that they have and getting whatever they can out of it so that they can dip out. Connor, um, what is what does this mean for VR um, as a medium or as a pillar in this industry? And um, is Sony now just, is, is Sony backing its way out of the VR game? Well, Sony itself was just one of the worst uh, VR uh, titles to get or consoles to get. I because disagree. Had- PSVR one was an affordable price uh, and had solid games on it, and and uh, you know played to a base of a, a hundred million consoles. You know, yeah. like people had it. I'm more talking about the VR uh, VR two because okay. of the fact it has so much of a buy in mm. that other virtual reality headsets don't require. You know, they kind of struck gold with the first one. And they thought, well, that must mean everyone wants this. Clearly they didn't because now they're struggling with the second one, like you said, pretty much right out the gate. So ultimately, the, the kind of the thing about headsets is they don't really, there doesn't seem to be a single one that's ahead of the curb 
compared to all of the other ones in terms of technology. So it's just different variations of headsets you're getting. And when you have to have a PS5 to work with this one, whereas the other ones you don't have to, and it's tapping more into the PC base, who, once again, when we covered that story a while ago, we kind of both agreed that the VR scene is more dominated by people who have PCs rather than people who have PlayStations. You know, I don't think... You know, clearly that you can see that in how the PSVR 2 is sold, because you would think if there actually was a market to tap into, they would have been able to do so with their new headset. Because I remember they really amped up some VR games, like Call of the Mountain, and then it came out, no one really cared. Yeah. Uh, Village is yet to be out. No, it, I it, believe Village is out. No, Village I mean, is VR mode. VR 4 is yet to be oh, out. Oh, 4, 4, yeah, 4, yeah, yeah Resident Evil 4 is not out yet. Which, that has the most potential to get more people on your console because it's looked the most striking. Yeah. But Village also didn't really make a major splash. It, you know, I think it was in the uh, the spotlight for like a week maybe. And then it just... It was a lot of, oh, hey, this is it. cool. You can do this, that type of stuff. Yeah. Um, I think I, I think I mostly agree with you on a lot of this. I, I, I think the story is a little bit more nuanced. And again, I think it just comes down to Sony's expectations. What were they? For the VR, for the first iteration, they were in check. Uh, I think they produced a smaller amount and uh, were were and the 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 sales surpassed expectations. But then launching uh, what two years after uh, a PlayStation Five, whereas PSVR launched multiple years after the launch of the four, um, you got the four off the ground faster. It sold faster, uh, whereas five obviously. Uh, they were having a bunch of production issues. You couldn't get it to the people fast enough. Um, so a lot of people ended up spending $500 in 2021, 2022. Um, and then to turn around and ask them for another $500 uh, on top of that and not providing the heat, not providing, you know, the sauce in yep. that. Like, yeah, no, yeah, you, you, you're you fighting a losing battle there. Um <clears throat> I mean, I just, like, I don't think the PC console, th like, I think it's, like, VR is a bougie device no matter where you get it. Um, it it's, a, like, it's a small sect of people who would be interested in this. I don't know why. I don't know why. It, 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 I can't define a clear reason as to why VR is not failing, but it, it, it doesn't seem to be hitting it in a mainstream way at all. And I don't know why it's not. Um, maybe it's, maybe it's the price point. Maybe it's, you know, the risk of motion sickness in that. Um, likely it's probably because we just don't have full video game experiences, at least not a lot of examples of full video game experiences. You know, you have your Half-Life Alex's, you have, uh, like your mosses or, or, you know, Blade and sorcery. A lot of people play yeah. Or, or, you know, you can play some Resident Evil games in VR, um, which is all cool. Um, but a lot of them are like really small like you know job simulator type things uh and so forth and i know the vr market has grown a lot more since job simulator was was popping but it, it there, there's just not like a great reason to jump in and i'm curious if it's just because because the player has so much more freedom in vr maybe it's harder to develop full games in vr in in some way and it takes a lot more money or, or something like that so the risk doesn't seem to match the reward on that. And, you know, with how volatile the industry is, I, you know, I get it. Like, all right, let's make a traditional video game as opposed to taking on this, this grand experiment. Um, so like, I don't think VR is going anywhere. I think it's established itself well enough to be like, Oh, there's always going to be VR experiences. Sony, however, I think, um, Oddly enough, I could I could foresee them dipping back into the mobile handheld market, um, you know, uh, with the success of the PlayStation Portal, um, the minor the minor success that we've seen with the PlayStation Portal. I think it exceeded Sony's expectations, um, and sort of just the vacancy in that. And, and I say that, but like, there's been other competitors, uh, the Steam Deck, the Switch, and stuff like that. But like, uh, there there's not just like a piece of hardware that is able to take on the go. Um, as much anymore and so i'm i'm curious if uh they see the success of the portal and go oh well, what if we just figure out a way to take a playstation on the go you know something like that so um well you know that that's I, that's I think that would work a lot better for them anyway there'd be a, a lot more reasons to buy that 
as opposed to buying a PlayStation VR 2. Well, the you know the convenience of being able to carry a console wherever you go is a lot more appealing than a technology that I think a lot of people still see as pretty gimmicky, uh, particularly with the games that they offer. I tried VR, uh, the headset itself, over at Phil's, and it looks cool. It was nicer than I thought it was going to be, and it oh, kind yeah. of eradicated my idea of you know what VR the VR experience was like. Yeah. But even then, I wasn't like I need to get this right now. Yeah. And Phil, I think he only got it because he had like a good deal on it or whatever. It was that. It was, it was that. But that was also years ago at this point. Yeah. yeah. So like, uh, and that that's another point. To get VR, you have to experience VR, and yeah. when. You know, there's limited outlets for that. You know, it becomes a problem. I've been to VR arcades and had a fucking blast. Like, yeah. uh, you know, I went with family members. My dad is not a gamer. He jumped into a headset and he was like, whoa, wait, whoa, whoa. How much are these? These That was a really cool experience. I wouldn't mind doing that. And I was like, well, huh. I don't know about that for you and so forth. So I talked him out of that because it just wouldn't have been a, right, a good fit for him. But the fact that it impressed him enough to even think about it is something really, really cool. But you had to try um, so, it. Yeah, v- VR has a future. It's just how big is that future? I don't know if it's that big. I don't think it'll ever really crack into mainstream uh, ways like that. As of right now, I'm not interested in buying a VR device at all. If I want to have that experience, I'll go find a VR arcade near mm-hmm. me. You know, t- t- stuff like that. So. It- it's unfortunate uh, it- that it just kind of seems to be third wheeling i guess you could say but you know definitely you know it, it is what it is moving on topic number three our uh my second penny of the day uh experimental video game made. let me try that again experimental video game made purely with ai failed because tech was unable to replace talent this is from ryan densdale over at ign Video game support developer Keywords Studios tried to create a game solely using artificial intelligence, but failed because the technology was, quote, unable to replace talent. As reported by game developer, Keywords said in its uh, latest financial state, Keywords said in its, that's such a terrible name for a studio. (laughs) Keywords said in its latest financial earnings report that it tried using the controversial technology to create a 2D game solely using Gen AI. The process lasted six months and highlighted, quote, where Gen AI has the potential to augment the game development process and where it lags behind. Keywords said the AI tool, quote, identified over 400 tools evaluating and utilizing those with the best potential, but it, quote, ultimately utilized bench resources from seven different game development studios as part of the project as the tooling was unable to replace talent. It therefore ascertained game development could not exist without real people and that AI could only be used as another tool in the process. Quote, one of the key learnings uh, was that whilst Gen AI may simplify or accelerate certain processes, the best results and quality needed uh, can only be achieved by experts in their field utilizing Gen AI as a new powerful tool in the creative process, Keywords said. The game will not be released to the public as it was just a research project and Keywords didn't provide any additional information about what type of 2D game it created. Uh, The developer is one of the biggest outsourcing studios in the world and have worked on several high caliber games such as Baldur's Gate 3, The Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom, and Alan Wake 2. So, um, surprising nobody. Hey, AI can only make things from things that already exist. It can't create something from nothing. Uh, it, it, it has to take its ideas from somewhere. And here is a great example. We tried, we made, we had an experiment, we tried, uh, but it just pulled a bunch of shit from other people's work um, and, and tried to make a Frankenstein monster of a game, and it just wasn't very good. When problems arise in game development, you need a human being. You need an artist. You need a creative. You need uh, somebody who just understands the technology and the language of the technology in order to problem solve and get over humps and so forth. Um, to steal the quote right there, AI is unable to replace talent. Bottom line. That sounds very nice. And as someone who doesn't like the emergence of AI, it does sound nice to me. But the thing to focus on is 
I remember the exact kind of things being said when you saw the doctored images and videos uh, not looking great, uh, particularly the uh, fingers. You usually would have six or yeah. seven fingers, and everyone just shit on it online. But now... I mean, it still happens. You'll see a dog does. running, and it's got a fifth leg. Exactly. But now there's certain images and videos where you can't it's really hard. tell. It's hard to tell. And that was only in a short amount of time. So right now, it can't replace talent, but will it eventually? Possibly. You know, this is an emerging technological field, and we don't really know what it's fully capable of. While I certainly agree this is be a far, t- like, a far way off from them actually being able to recreate games entirely, never underestimate that the companies we're dealing with are greedy by nature. Yeah. Uh, they will save cost, save money by making more of their workforce, essentially, be AI. And so, even though this didn't work out, it's probably not going to be a big deterrent for some companies. And I mean, if we can, large. if we can use AI to as a tool to sort of supersede the process a little bit and get through some of the more headache-inducing problems um, a little bit, I'm all for it. Cut down on development time. Cut down on our devel- development cost. Um, it could extend longevity of key roles as a you know uh, as opposed to replacing them entirely. Um, on top of that, uh, like you would get games faster, which means these publishers would get their money back more um, and would, you know, ascertain profit more. Um, and so hopefully, like all of like I, I'm, I'm looking at it in the most optimistic route. Sure. The most realistic route is that it will take jobs. Yes. Um, and that sucks. That is something I, I would rather it not do at all. Um, but this is the growth of technology. Like this is this is the the yin and yang of it, and you know if if I if AI could make it if if AI is the rising tide and all ships can come up from it, then that means like maybe we can get some more ships, some game developers, some new game dev studios, and so forth. Uh, like maybe it, if the problem right now is time and money, and AI can come in. And and eliminate some of that time, equating to more money. Maybe that means we can get more game devs, more game studios, more video games out. Um, and and that way the industry the the it might it could potentially be a way that the industry can find some stability. That's certainly the most optimistic way to look at it. You know, I actually have a real world example of how that could be useful outside of the video game uh, industry. I have a coworker whose boyfriend is a programmer of some sorts, and uh, he uses Chat GPT. And sometimes when he's writing code and there's some, you know, error in it or whatever, he enters it into Chat GPT and it'll say, oh, this is where you went wrong, and instantly point out the problems. Alleviating, I don't know how many what, issues would come it, about. It, yeah, I, I hear, I hear programmers talk about that. That issue could be five minutes long. It could be two hours long. Yeah. Exactly. What else could you have done in those two hours? You know, if, if if you could just easily plug it into a program and the program say th- this is where the error is, and and then you fix it really quickly, or it fixes it for you, um, and, and you're able to just keep on creating from there. Yeah. You know, there's ups and downs to this conversation, so we shouldn't outright reject it. It's just when it comes to the creation aspect of things, that should be left in the hands of human beings. It should, and so is the uh, aspect of regulation of these technologies, Agreed. because, you know, really the ball's in the government's court to how this technology is going to be used and what the limitations of it are. No, but Connor, we need to, we need to ban TikTok. We do. That's what we need to do. It is. You know? We can't have China coming in and stealing our information. Right. Only the American companies can do that, God damn it, because sure. this is America. Sure. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Moving on. Uh, <laughs> final Lord topic knows. of the day. Let's get a fun one in there, Connor. Let's stop talking about all this boring-ass fucking news and talking about layoffs and stuff. Uh, let's have a little bit of fun over here from Game Informer. Take it away, my friend. Among Us! Jesus. Game Informer. I know you were going to hate that. Uh, Among Us animated show casts Ashley Johnson, Elijah Wood, Randall Park, and Yvette Nicole Brown. The Among Us animated series began being developed at CBS Studios has found its purple, green, red, and... Uh, you know, purple, green, red, and orange crew members in Ashley Johnson, The Last of Us, Elijah Wood, The Lord of the Rings trilogy, Randall Park, Ant-Man, Always Be My Maybe, and Yvette Nicole Brown, 
community, Drake and Josh, the official Among Us X account, formerly Twitter, announced this news today with a tweet showing that each of these crew members will look like in the show. Yeah, and there's a uh, there's a purple one with a, a little cap on him, <laughs> a little sheriff's outfit. Red with the captain's hat because he's, I guess, the captain. Green with a little military hat because green is the military. And oh, orange, that's uh, who Yvette Nicole Brown is. Yeah, she's very good in Community. Oh, she's, she's one she's of the funniest fun. characters in that show. She, she's fun. I like that. Anyways, I mean, it gives a description of what their personality traits are. Yeah. Watch the show for that. You don't need to read the article for it. Red, red no. Captain of the Skeleton, People Pleaser, Blowhard, Task, Leadership, Confidence, Fun Fact, Failed Upwards. All right, cool. Green, unpaid intern, happy to be there. Task, whatever they're told. Fun Fact gets paid in pizza. All right, I like that. That's fun. Uh, do we have do we have things such as dates or anything like that? Members well, of the crew have been replaced by ships. Uh, no, it doesn't seem like it. No, nope. all right. Really just the big name actors for the main roles. I I'm mean, into it. This good cast, this show could go one of two ways. Yeah. It'd be incredibly cash grabby and pathetic or very funny. It could so, be very fun. It could be. Could yeah. be. Could be a lot of fun. Uh, I hope it is. I have no idea what an Among Us show looks like. Is a season, is the entire season going to be figuring out who the imposter is? Is it an episode by episode basis and it's different every time? And we are using these archetypes to tell fun stories and fun little things. How long are these episodes? Are they 23 f- minutes. I feel. I, I I imagine you can't go any longer than that, right? No. Yeah. I dude, I'm curious if it's more like twelve to fifteen minutes, you know? Um, which I think would be fine. What is the rating on this show? I mean, you would assume it's kid focused and, and and so forth, but you know, Among Us can get a little violent in there, you know. Among Us seems like one of those things that if it had an adaptation in the form of a movie or TV show, it would be raunchy. I feel like that's the angle they would go for. But they easily couldn't. I they, mean, I mean, I they think they could go either up. ways. I think, I think Scooby Doo. You know, I think that's a that's a great example of 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 how to f- formulaically uh, create an episodic show around the idea of Among Us. Is every week, hey, there's an imposter. We have to find one. You know, and here's a wacky scenario that our characters are in, which are allowing them to you know, uh, uh, do this, that, and the third. And it's, it, hey, it's always the guy who disappears with the, with the first guy who, kill, who gets killed <laughs> yeah, or whatever, yeah. you know? Like, uh, like just how in Scooby-Doo, it's always the old man yelling at yelling at the kids on his yard type thing. You know what I mean? But the, the, the thing with the Scooby-Doo comparison is that's held up by the iconic characters of the Scooby-Doo crew or the mystery gang. I think you could create that with... with oh, definitely. Just col- I mean, and, and the fact that the names are just colors. Like, the characters are just colors. That tells me children. Yeah. Like, you know, uh, like I can see my nephew going, green, green, no, <laughs> yeah. you know, like something like that, you know? So, I don't know. It could be fun. could be interesting. Uh, are, are are you willing to check it out? It really depends on the trailer for these kinds of things. Yeah. It really just tickles my funny bone. I'll go for it, you know? Yeah. Especially if it's like, as you said, 12 minutes, 11 minutes, more of a shorter series. Yeah. I might jump in on it, but I feel like I say that with most shows that uh, uh, most video game adaptation movies slash TV shows that get announced, I always have a, a passing interest in it. But then when my life catches up with me, the last thing I really think about is watching a animated Among Us TV show. I don't even watch the Halo show, partly because it looks like ass, but I've even heard, then, I've heard not great. I've heard not CBS. Great. What's, what, what streaming service does CBS have? Peacock? No. Is that right? Um, maybe. CBS. There's so many dumb fucking streaming services nowadays. Streaming service. Literally stupid. Makes no sense. Oh, oh. How can oh. I watch CBS on my? God, look at you looking that up on my computer. On it's my, gonna oh, give you, it's Christ. gonna give you a. Uh, oh ads my God, from it's giving on. me. It's giving Paramount Plus maybe. That's it's, different, isn't it? Maybe. No, no. It says NFL on CBS, CBS Show, CBS All Access under Paramount Plus. So it shows up on Paramount Plus. Is that maybe? what the Office is? Isn't it? I think so. I don't know. Couldn't tell you. Mm-hmm. Uh, but no, I'd be interested in this. And I'd watch it. With how well Among Us did as a game, it's probably going to sell well, too. I, I love this cast. This is a great cast. Yeah. These are people who could I could see just jump into a booth and have fun every week and just be like, yeah, man, I jump in, I do my lines, and, you know, we go, ah, oh, and then and then we leave. You know, it's a good paycheck. All mm-hmm. right, cool. I'm into it. Uh, it, it. It was already a mega hit, especially, you know, with younger audiences and so forth. So I could totally see, like, hey, man, yeah, we put out a short episode every week, and, you know, the kids love it. 
I will say though, why is Randall Park dressed up as the host of the Blues Clues? Blues Clues. It's his headshot. You know, it's just his headshot. You know, he looks good in that picture though. Anyways. Ladies and gentlemen, that is going to be it for the two penny games cast. But don't go anywhere. I forgot to mention it at the top of the episode, Connor. It's Final Fantasy VII Rebirth Week, my friend. It's time to give our thoughts and opinions on that. So make sure you stick around for that. We're going to reintro the review because it also is always a breakout over at youtube.com slash at two penny games. And make sure you like, subscribe, and share with a friend. We post every Tuesday, 8 a.m. Central Time, youtube.com slash at Two Penny Games, and mainstream podcast services of your choice. Make sure to like and follow and subscribe. Let us know what you thought about this week's news uh, down in the comments below. Uh, Let us know if there's any topics you would like us to cover or questions you have for us. We would love to introduce a Two Penny uh, uh, segment from the audience. But until next time, have a great time. And Connor, say goodbye to the people. I'm captivated by this disgusting ad I'm seeing here. What's poppin', players? Welcome back to a Two Penny Games review. This time, Final Fantasy VII Rebirth. I am your host and lead reviewer, Tavin Bothell, here with my good friend and co-host. Say hello to the people, Connor Elliott. Are you ready to talk about one of the best games of 2024? I think I am, Connor. I think I am indeed. Fantastically. Connor, Final Fantasy VII Rebirth is here. We've been playing it. I have rolled credits uh, after 60 hours. How? What is your hour count looking like right now? About 43. Oh wow. Yeah. Yeah. But you're not. You're. You're not even. You're f- far away from the ending. At, at this really, you're, ta- you're taking it a lot slower. You're enjoying your time. The everlasting gobstopper that is Final Fantasy VII Rebirth. I wanted to get in it. Get it in. Get to the review. Uh, and, and make sure I had a complete picture of what's going on here. So I have beaten Final Fantasy VII Rebirth. And it's an interesting thing, uh, my relationship with Final Fantasy VII now, because uh, Final Fantasy VII Remake back in 2020 was my first Final Fantasy VII experience. Uh, and then since then, I've played the original game three times, thanks to you. Uh, Final Fantasy VII OG review is up on the channel right now, youtube.com slash at Two Penny Games. Make sure you subscribe and like that. We, we reviewed it for the Two Penny Game Club. We had a lot of great things to say. We criti- crit- criticized it where necessary. Uh, it, most of the things we criticized are because of its age. Mm-hmm. But, you know, some other things that we were like, ah, this part's kind of, you know, whatever. But overall, we were very positive of it. It's one of my favorite RPGs of all time. And um, Remake. Uh, the the first part of this three part series was also a great game that I love very very much. I believe was was the was it your game of the year that year or no? It I mean, was. It was. Yeah. Yes. Uh, anyway. So yeah, it was a fantastic time. And ladies and gentlemen, Rebirth is no different, and that's because Final Fantasy VII Rebirth is an amazing game. I love this game. This game is phenomenal. This is one of my favorite video games of all time. But man. Is it far from a perfect video game? This game's got some issues. This game's got some problems. Um, I want to start with the positive, though. Uh, The best parts about this game uh, is the characters. Their interactions, how they talk to each other, how they interact with each other, their bond and how it grows and and supersedes. There are moments in this game that I never thought I would have uh, with the characters from the original game that I'm getting here, and I can't believe they're here. Um, so many high highs, so many low lows in terms of emotional roller coasters, and I, I really cannot stress enough that these characters are are possibly the best cast of characters in all of gaming history. Period, uh, rivaled only by Mass Effect. I would say I can't. I struggle to think of another cast of characters that that could even be in the conversation of being better than this. Uh, the combat has been expanded upon from Final Fantasy VII Remake in a lot of really smart ways. This has become easily one of my top probably three favorite combat systems of all time. Uh, it, it's it's dynamic, it is deep, it is dense, or it is simple. Ex- whatever you want to make of this combat system, you can get out of it with this game. Um, of course, the deeper you get into it and the more involved you get, the more rewarding it is. Um, but if you just want to like mash a square button and then throw a random ability out, uh, every once in a while that works too. I, I, I really do think, uh, this combat system is some of the most fun you can have in an action RPG ever. And I, once again, 
every RPG developer should take notes. This should be the combat system you look at when you're trying to think of how do I make an action RPG? This is how you do it. Um, and uh, the music, phenomenal. Oh, God, it's so good. So many different iterations of classic songs, so many new songs, uh, and, and so many smart uses and implementation of the music, and it really is just phenomenal. And I also think the side quests are pretty good here. Are they world-class? No, but they're pretty good for the most part. The, this is the, the the green icons side quests is what I mean specifically. Um, and... Mini games on top of mini games on top of mini games. This experience cannot get old because there's just so many different things that you can do. Not all of them are great. Some of them pretty lame. Uh, but you have absolute bangers like Queen's Blood, like Chocobo Racing, and a couple of others that really I could sink dozens of hours in. Queen's Blood is now my new favorite video game card game. It has surpassed Gwent in my eyes. It is just a load of fun, and I, I want it to be its own spin-off thing, like a PvP type thing where we can build decks and, and, and play against each other in that way. Because um, it, it, it's just a blast. I love it so much. Now, uh, to talk about some of the negative things. Um, because and I really want to really pressure this. Uh, this game is legit one of my favorite video games ever. I adore it. Um, but it's got a couple of issues. Um, mainly, um, I've got, I've got three main issues with this game. Uh, the first is it's attempt at open world design is so copy paste, boring, um, Ubisoft checklist styling that it makes Ubisoft games look interesting. Um, the open world elements of this game, I really do think fail to justify their existence. Uh, they are run over there, fight a thing, climb a tower, scan the world, scan this thing. Like it, it is the most droll, boring, uh, uninteresting activities that uh, you could do in an open world setting. Um, the next is the bloat from remake is still felt here. Especially in the later chapters of the game, there are multiple segments where I sit there and go, this isn't fun. I don't want to do this. Can we get past this? And uh, and it's sprinkled all throughout, but it really starts hitting in those later double-digit chapter numbers where I go, wow, this is a lot. Um, I, I would rather us be past this part. Um, and third, and probably my biggest critique, is this ending sucks. It's not good. Um, now, granted, the journey was so good that it it doesn't matter that the last hour or two was so disappointing. Um, it's not that I don't get it. I get it. It's just I just don't I don't agree with the direction we're going. Um, and it left me feeling uh, frustrated, confused. And overall, um, I kept asking myself, what was the point um, of choices that we made in remake and choices we made throughout rebirth what was the point um if it all accumulated to this and i can't really get any deeper into that without spoilers connor when you finish the game we do i do want to do a spoiler cast of some kind we have about to. it yeah i think so yeah. um but yeah I, I i really think it's just a baffling ending um that honestly is quite cowardice uh like i i think um Square Enix is wanting to have their cake and eat it too, and I I would have rathered I would have rather different choices. Or in fact, to be more specific, I would have rathered them to have made a choice. Um and, and so yeah, I, I I was very, very disappointed in the ending. But that's two hours out of a 60 plus hour game. I could have gone to 70. I could have broken 100 hours in this game if I didn't want to rush and see the ending. And Connor, that's when I want to take it to you, my friend, because you are taking your time with this game. Uh, and, and I want to know what your experience is so far. Well, I'll touch on some of the points you did. Mm -hmm. The combat's amazing. It is one of the best co action combat systems that any game has ever produced. There's a reason why they built themselves off of Remake, because they already had struck gold. 
with the combat system. After playing Final Fantasy 16 last year, a game that I enjoyed primarily because of the narrative reasons, because the gameplay uh, with the more DMC... God, this game, this game shits on Final Fantasy 16 combat. It, it, it unfortunately, it does. It. <laughs> because DMC was clearly an inspiration for Final Fantasy 16. And unfortunately, they also made it too easy at the same time. So it leads to a very blasé combat system, given the length of the game. Which is, you know, I don't even remember what my hours were. 60 or something like that? Something like that, yeah. Yeah. But, you know, tons of minigames. I mean, they really give you just like minigame after minigame after minigame. And they're all unique. And I've had fun with pretty much all of them. The characters, I love how they just talk, you know? That's what, that was what, playing through it again, the original Final Fantasy VII was lacking. You would just get a lot more surface level uh, material from the characters due to the fact that you're kind of going large periods of time where you're just walking to an objective over land, fighting enemies and whatnot. And there wasn't the technology to allow for your characters to just talk while you're walking. This one rectifies that with making me actually chuckle and laugh and, you know, really enjoy myself with the conversations these characters that I already loved are having to make them even better. You had mentioned it while we were doing the, uh, while we were playing it. Tifa and Aerith, originally, they had a relationship that was kind of, we're both going for the same man, and so there's some friction there. This one, that friction is there, but in a more realistic way that doesn't get in the way of their friendship, which yeah, is they're, just they're, charming to watch. They are friends first. Yes. I, I kept, throughout my entire experience, I kept going, look at these women supporting women, man. <laughs> they're, they're the best, they're like just two little besties, you know? And it, it, like, yes, the love triangle stuff is still kind of there. You know, and there is there are moments where one character is like, oh, yeah, you know, I was with Cloud last night and the other one will go, huh? Mm -hmm. But and that's it. But that's all that will happen because they go, well, why were you like in their head? But there it's not worth talking about. You feel like if if a relationship were to form between Cloud and one of them, the other one would be like, "Okay, cool. Happy for you guys. You know, like it wouldn't be like, ugh. Why her? Like type shit. Like it's there's no 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 cattiness there, and there's cattiness in the original game. There is, and yeah. they eradicated it here for the better. Kate Sith, you know Sucks. he's he's not to play. He's not good. As I kind of found out recently, it struck me when I was fighting against these sandworms, and they like take away your party members, and all I had was Kate Sith, and I found myself just not being able to do almost anything with him. Just with his basic attacks, really can't get up his ATB meter to do the cooler yeah. abilities that uh, characters have access to. I, 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 I want to add on to that and in, in talking about combat. It is unbelievable how there are this many playable characters and they all feel like they should have their own video game. Yeah. Like they are just fully formed uh, uh, animations, combat stylings. They all play differently. And they all, for the most part, play well, with the exception, I agree with you, Kate Sith is not fun to play as. But if you don't like him, just play the other party members. And I did, a, so far, without having beaten the game, his personality interjects a certain level of fun that was missing from some of the base cast members. Not in a way that vastly improves the game, but I found myself not being annoyed at him every single time he spoke or had an interaction with somebody, which as someone who's always hated Kate Sith since the original game, I was happy to not be so disappointed with him in that regard. Though he's still, even then, the weakest character. You know, Red 13, you know, they do so many cool things with him. So yeah. great. And I haven't even gotten to his part of the story. Oh, Each man. character kind of has their own uh, like main plot line from what I've understood. Barrett as well. We'll talk more about that in our spoiler cast when we eventually do that. But suffice it to say, they overall do very well in that. A everybody gets a moment. Everyone does. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I the narrative's been great so far, but of course, I haven't beaten it, and I have heard no more said people weren't going to like the ending of this one, and it seems that's rung true so far. I don't like it. Yeah, I don't like it at all. Which uh, I don't mind because I mean, I like it when artistic uh, directors of some sort of any kind have a certain vision with their game and they do it regardless of how the uh, masses like us are going to perceive it and receive it. You know, for the better or worse. I just like the concept I, of that. I, ha I have a response to that. I, uh, I like that too. <laughs> but? But yeah. I, I, like, uh, I don't think that's what's happening here. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I just can't go any deeper without yeah. spoiling. And I don't want to spoil it for you because I don't want, I don't want your idea of it to be tainted by my 
perception of the ending. Yeah. Um. And, and I I would like you to like have your own thoughts on it. But yeah, I I yeah I I don't like it. I I don't I don't agree with the choices. Mm-hmm. Um. It doesn't make me any less excited for the third game. I'm still excited for the third game. Um. I'm excited for the character moments. I'm excited for uh the combat to grow. I'm excited for um. I'm excited for an evolution of the open world mechanics that we see in this game. Um, But it resets my expectations for what the third game will be narratively wise. Yeah. Um, And and so, uh, yeah, so it's complicated and we'll get into that into a spoiler cast within hopefully the next couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. Um, We'll see. We're very busy over here. Uh, you know, as soon as we can, we'll get into that. But yeah, uh, ending aside, I mean, bro, like, let, like, I'll round up and say my experience was seventy hours. Seventy hours, sixty-eight of them were phenomenal. Mm-hmm. You know, that's what. Like, what am I gonna say? Like, you know. Uh, but yeah, I, I, the, my only real thing is just like the areas where there's that that bloat, which like isn't necessarily bad content except for a couple of moments which have been pointed out online of like why am i throwing these boxes just to flip switches you'll know the part when <laughs> when you get there um you know moments like that uh and the 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 open world design i think is just severely lacking i think it's pretty boring and to that point as someone who has experienced a lot of the open world you've done a lot more of the open yes. world stuff than i have the core things that there are core things that uh you do in terms of side content yeah and open world stuff and it's the same every single region you go to, mm-hmm. which can be, first of all, annoying because it's just like that checklist you were talking about. It's so much of a checklist that each time you complete an objective in the open world, there's a series of dots denoting each thing that you can do in that the open world. The dots were driving out. me crazy, man. It was such like Assassin's Creed 1 and 2 <laughs> synchronization like level type stuff. I was like, holy shit, we're doing this? Literally a checklist, you know, in real time in the game. Uh, that being said... There is a lot of value even in this uh, less than realized open world. First being, there is a... What the fuck's it called? It's, it's something involving like a thing called a proto-relic. It has a certain mission name type that are in each region that have their own storyline that they start setting up and their own minigame that's attached to it. The I actually missed the entire minigame or the entire side quest in the first area, but I did the second and third one. The second one, you do Fort Condor battle, which is like a strategic Yeah, I, mi- I missed Fort Condor. Yeah. I played it in, in the Intergrade DLC or Intermission DLC. Um, and I, I I enjoyed it pretty well there, so like, you know, I was disappointed to like be to get to the end of my experience and go that was great. Oh wait, where where is that? Yeah, and and it's 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 very nice and fun, and it leads to that you know it, you know the little interesting story that it's creating. But then the third area, you have to basically go track down uh, Cactuar Rock and unlock an area to do a mini game where you have to defeat as many as possible. And uh, it has its own little rules that are associated with it. Yeah. And it's I'm interested to see how else they not only develop that storyline, but what new mini games they throw at you. Because they went above and beyond instead of just doing the same exact mini game, change it up in each region. You also have your excavation sites where you can use your chocobo to dig things up, which directly impact some of the more you know extra side content you can do, such as uh, upgrading, not upgrading. Uh, you're talking like crafting stuff? Yeah, craft, uh, crafting item. special items that you sometimes can only get through the item crafting system that the game uh, has in it. Which is fine. It's fine, yeah. It's fine. It's but functional. It works. It's fast. It's the fact that it still rewards you for doing these little excavation things that, unfortunately, you have to find out about by going to these springs that are around the map that just require you to press some buttons, and there you go. You got it, and that's it. Yeah. You know, pretty uninspiring, but what it sometimes leads to is inspiring. Uh, the side quests. They're not that great itself, but... They're very, like, fetch questy. Very fetch questy. Go over here, fight those enemies, go grab that item, bring it back, like, type yeah. things. But, but the conversations that happen along the way, like, the uh, to not get into too many spoilers, there's, like, but to provide at least one example, there's one fairly early into the game uh, where you're, you're running up a mountain going off to fetch something. I don't remember. Mm-hmm. But there's a conversation between Barrett and Cloud about Cloud's mom's response of when he left his small town to go join up and, and join the service and join Shinra. Um, 
and that conversation is something I never expected these two characters to have. And they had it, and it was well-written, well-performed. It was charming, funny, a little sad at the same time. You know, and and, and that that's where the game just shines, is how these characters interact with each other. And it, it makes it even a point to let you know when you start one of these side quests that it's going to be in connection with one of your party members. Mm -hmm. Generally, it'll be always Cloud talking to some guy, and Red 13 will be there. and be like, I'm interested in this quest. And that's who you not only have these interesting conversations with, like with Barrett, but you are impacting the uh, relationship yeah. mechanic that is in the game. It was in the original one, but they've made it more forward, with you having icons above your party members uh, in certain parts of the game and whenever you deepen your relationship with them. Yeah. And that has certain narrative implications as well. Uh, two times in the game that I'm aware of, maybe more since I've uh, not gone completely through. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, it basically functions a lot like a almost like a persona social link yeah. kind of mechanic, where like you're you're forming bonds with your party members and so forth through cloud, and these bonds can be increased either by doing uh, side quests that involve them. There are moments in the game where they give you dialogue options, just cute little flavor text to kind of craft your experience the way you want to of course you know cloud is still cloud and mm -hmm. and barrett is still barrett so you know the, these conversations uh still have to play out a certain way but it just gives you a little bit of agency in how that all works and um uh you can also increase it by doing synergy attacks um that is either like little quick combo things that you can do by pressing a hot key or by building up your synergy bar um, and this is the expansion on the combat system that I think has taken what was already a really awesome combat system and pushed it to the next level. Um, where you 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 build up a synergy bar by doing your normal ATB attacks, which are just like your special attacks when you build up your bar. The, this game this game has done its best to just basically put turn based combat into an action game, uh, and and I love I love it for that. Anyways, um, so when you when um, Two characters build up their bar, usually after they do about three, sometimes four ATB um, abilities of their own. This can be either casting a spell or or using specific um, uh, weapon abilities and so forth like that. Um, whether it's like Cloud's Braver or Triple Slash or using Cure or, or using Fire or Fire Magic and stuff like that. All of that builds up the synergy. And when two characters have, both have enough synergy built up, uh, they can do uh, an actual synergy ability. This can vary from doing damage, uh, doing elemental damage or just doing a heavy combo damage. Uh, and it comes with a really cool animation every time that I never got tired of. And every time you do one of these abilities, it gives you a little bonus. Uh, this varies from sometimes it's just giving you a third ATB bar so that your ATB builds up faster and you can have more attacks pop off all at once, which is great. Um, or uh, it'll make it to where uh, magic attacks don't cost any MP. Or it'll unlock another limit break for each character to use you would you might know just because you're diving in more characters only have one default limit break right you other than activating the synergy you you, uh, you have not found any extra limit breaks correct besides the one that get upgraded through the synergy abilities no i yeah. have not found any uh, neither have i but honestly don't need it no. like yeah because I, I there's already so many choices i don't need more <laughs> you yeah. know, yeah, know. Uh, and, and so many different ways to build and um this system allows them to dive even deeper into boss fights. I'll say it plainly. When you're fighting things in the open world, it's the combat's not really engaging. It's pretty much just mash square until the enemy's dead, for the most part. With a couple of specific, like, you know, certain enemy types that take a little bit more physical damage, maybe you'll use a quick magic attack on them or something like that. Um, but when you get into the boss fights, um, or even just really hard fights, like with you know, sometimes they'll rush you with a bunch of uh, enemies or uh, sometimes it'll just be two or three tougher enemies that you have to, like, think just a little bit on how, how to do it. Um, but the boss fight specifically, you have to dive deep and go, okay, this is who is in my party right now. These are the, the possible combinations that I can use and abilities I can use in combination with the materia system, which we all know is awesome, um, and, and in how to... Um, develop a strategy in order to beat this boss. Some of these bosses are hard, really hard. Some of them will kick your ass so bad you go, oh, I need to go grind. 
to go beat this boss, especially early on. You're, you'll, you'll fight multiple bosses that make you go, oh my God, I'm not ready for this, <laughs> you know? Um, and they do that pretty much the entire experience where like there's just times where you go, I don't know if I can do this. And then it feels so good when you do do it and, mm-hmm. and the, 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 the numbers work out in your favor. This game, like I could go all day talking about the combat. Uh, going even deeper, um, it was a problem in Remake where like you would enter a battle and you would face a new enemy type and they would be weak to a certain elemental that you didn't have equipped in your materia. So you'd have to lose, leave, come back, uh, re-equip and come back. Um, here they've kind of solved that through the folios, folios, is that yep. what they called? Uh, upgrade tree where you can, uh, this is where you get your, your different synergy attack upgrades. This is where you get your stat boosts, like, uh, more damage resistance, more, uh, attack damage, more elemental damage, you know, stuff like that. But it's also where you can unlock specific moves for each individual, uh, character. Specifically, there's moves in there that allow you to do elemental damage, um, for no MP cost. These moves aren't very damage heavy, but they do allow you to engage with the combat if your materia is enough to snuff or if, if you don't have the right materia equipped. So like you always have a wind damage ability so you can always stagger enemies who are weak to wind damage, um, which like it's just smart, right? Like oh, yeah. like instead of doing the crazy like 600, 700 damage that the materia would do, it does like one to 200 damage. Uh, but you get that stagger up still. So yes. you you when you are when your back is against the wall, you always have options. Mm-hmm. Very flashy game as well in the best kind of way. Yeah. So you were talking about the synergy abilities, limit breaks, of course, the boss fights. They just really enjoy giving you a spectacle, and it always has that level of badassery that with these kinds of games you kind of need because yeah. otherwise it just feels very like oh yeah, beat the new enemy and. Uh, Moving on to the next thing, but yeah. it really gives the fights a lot more weight to them. Well, yeah, that and the the enemy mechanics specifically are so diverse and dynamic that like you always feel when you engage with all of the mechanics, you feel impactful. That was my big criticism of Final Fantasy 16, is all damage felt exactly the same. Mm-hmm. It didn't seem like there was an optimal strategy to take enemies out other than mash square and uh do your your icon abilities, which different icons would have different elemental things in them but they wouldn't those elemental differences wouldn't do anything it was just color you know like as you were doing the flashy moves so like it it didn't feel like you had any difference it just felt like i was doing damage sponge after damage sponge here enemies can be damage spongy but there are ways around it and moves you can do to uh be smart about it and some of these enemies aren't like in Remake, for the most part, most enemies would be pressured or staggered through elemental damage, um, with a couple of exceptions, I think. Here, um, they get creative with it, where it's like, yes. hey, this enemy is only pressured after you dodge their this specific attack. Um, or this enemy is only pressured after using a combination of abilities. Or this an- enemy is only pressured after doing mass damage while it's charging up a kill ability or something like that so like it puts the pressure on the player it forces the player to always have um the access what is it called assess always have the assess material you have to have your assess material equipped at all times but like it forces the player to think it forces the player to come up with a strategy and when that strategy works it's so satisfying to do every single time and when you do stagger an, an opponent it's just it, you just sit there and you go, all right, pound town, baby. Let's beat this motherfucker's ass. It's especially nice when you're you're fighting a boss, particularly who's just very hard to hit, because the way that some of the uh, like you were mentioning, you need to use assess to find their specific weakness, not in terms of their element, but in terms of what tactic you need to employ to get up that pressure bar. It really makes those moments all the more satisfying when you eventually achieve it, and. Another cool thing that the open world also works hand in hand with it. It's it, it existed in Seven Remake, and I still love it here. Which is that every single time you get a weapon, there's a specific point to it, other than just increasing your damage uh, of your magical damage or your physical damage or whatever. You eventually get to a point where each one has an ability that's tied to it. Now that ability is only locked to that weapon unless you do certain uh, parameters to get the proficiency of that skill up. And once you complete it. 
you have that regardless of what weapon you pretty much just to. use the ability a lot. Yeah, yeah. You, most of the time, but sometimes it says something specific like use this ability and then use another ability after it. Because Does it really? Yeah, like that star- would explain why why some of these abilities are really hard for me to get. Yeah, yeah. Like some like Tifa's Star Shower. It says I think when you do it, it. She has that ability? It's on one of the weapons. Oh, I missed that weapon. I never got it. That was my favorite ability from the from yeah. the first game. I loved that. I was like, where is it? I can't find it. I mean, I think I missed a lot of Barrett's weapons, which, once again, these are some of the perks of going through the open world. It yeah. actually has, a, it gives you a reason to do it. Also, you have something like called a party level, which unlocks more of those folios you were folios, talking about. Yeah. And How do you feel about the folios versus like the weird galaxy things that they had in the first game? I don't really even remember the galaxy thing. Yeah, so in the first game, it was tied to... All of your upgrades were tied to your weapons. Yeah. Uh, and so you could... Uh, you know, you would unlock new materia slots. You would uh, be able to link materia slots. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. You could, um, you know, increase... Yes, yes. Yeah, it was a lot of stat. It was a lot of stat boosting differences and so forth. So, like, damage buffs and so forth like that. Um, it, but it was all tied to the weapon you had equipped. So like yeah. when you finally upgraded every weapon, um, they would their stats would kind of be locked here. I think there's a I don't I don't particularly prefer one over the other. I think for the most part it's just kind of different for the sake of being different. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, allowing allowing my character stats to be separated from the weapon and the weapon giving me different stats. I enjoy that more as an RPG player, being able to go a little deeper in that. You know, you, you talk about how, like, oh, you get a new weapon and you learn the new weapon ability. But the way these games are crafted, the first game was like this as well. Um, the way these games are crafted are so smart because every weapon is still viable. So you can pick and choose a favorite. I went back to the Buster Sword after being five or six swords deep and being like, all right. I think I have most of Cloud's weapons now, except for one that's probably going to be given to me near the end of the game. Mm-hmm. I'm going to look at the the pros and cons of each weapon and go, okay, but like what what fits my play style? And the Buster Sword, which was the first sword they gave me, worked the best for me. Same and, here. And so I was like, oh, let me go back to the Buster Sword. And I played a majority of the game with the Buster Sword. Um, and the fact that you could do that with each individual weapon and have your own personal like attachment to it whether it's like hey this sword does a lot of heavy physical damage this sword does a lot of heavy magic damage this sword has a lot of materia slots this sword has less materia slots but does more in this way um is awesome i love that um yeah i I, this is this is how you make an action rpg combat system like this this is the best way to do it everybody do this (laughs) please like it I, I I would never get tired of this. No. Ever. Especially with other games, which could change it up in any number of ways to fit that title. And I don't know if Square Enix will capitalize off of it. I hope they do, because they really did hit really well with it. But yeah, I don't I don't I don't foresee them going I don't foresee them doing another sixteen combat style. Like no. I don't think sixteen set the world on fire enough for that. Um and I like there, there were people like me who were very loud about how we don't like this. This is boring. Um, this isn't an RPG. They, we want the mechanics. And I think the, the, the remake series, the way they continue to expand on it and expound on this combat system, like, it's so fucking good. Let's get back to the music real quick. Oh, yeah. Dude. Dude. I- Insane music. Not just in how it sounds, because, of course, it's all fucking phenomenal, but how it changes throughout so like you know in the in the Nibelheim flashback sequence which is you know your tutorial of the game uh you know Tifa comes up in a little cowgirl outfit and it plays Tifa's theme which you and I are quite familiar with but it has like a little like western twang Mm -hmm. to it and I'm like man this is cute I like this um the chocobo racing song there's I, I've identified at least three different iterations of that song, one being like a hard rock version, one just being a classic, this is what Chao Kobo Racing should sound like, and then there was another one that I forget right now. But like the fact that it's all different is awesome. They also do it in ways of intention. So there's a moment in the game, and I forget exactly where it happens, but there's a moment where somebody bursts in the room and goes, Cloud, we need your help outside, and you hear one winged angel. Mm-hmm. Just, a, just a hint of it. Sephiroth isn't there, but... It's what Cloud is thinking at the time is Sephiroth is here. 
So he's running out and like to kind of dive deeper into character. They implement music in ways to kind of give you thoughts that you may not get from the animations, which are beautiful as well. Yeah, I know there's some moments where like I, I don't I don't want to call it Sephiroth's theme in Nibelheim. I think it's just called Sephiroth theme, where it just plays at like a different pace. Yeah. And it's a more like ominous moment. And so it play even though it's an already an ominous song, it just tones it down. And so if you know what the song originally yeah. sounded like, it perks you up and you like it really starts working its that happens. On you. That happens to me multiple times with Aerith's theme. Yes. yes there so there were so many times where Aerith's theme would play and it would be dour. And, and, and the moment wouldn't necessarily be dour, but because the music was, I would it, it would it's offsetting. You go what are we, what are we doing? What, like yeah. you, you sit up in your seat and go, what's happening? Um, Another one I'll touch on just because I always, it's, it's th- those springs that I was talking about mm-hmm. where you just get info on the world. Uh, the thing that I really like doing about those isn't the generic press the button to synchronize this rock. So you know what's going on in the world, which by the way, it does do cool things with telling you more about the region you're in, giving you a bit more uh, background information. So that is cool. Oh, that's neat. Yeah, it is. But I'll, I'll say this. <laughs> if there was a sneeze in the last game, that sneeze has a backstory of a three-hour <laughs> yeah. side quest that you didn't know was what ex- would exist in this game. Which what, is very what good. The, uh, the, one of the perks is like if you are familiar with the original game, the lengths that they go to expound on the world is super rewarding. There is so many arcs that you go through in this game specifically. They did it in the last one as well, but in this game specifically, where. An important story beat happens. It's It works. You're crying. You're going, oh, my God, this is amazing. And then you turn to the right, and there's something new there that wasn't in the original. But, you, it, like, the way they tied into the world, the lore, and, and just the, the, the world building of Final Fantasy VII, you sit here and go, this wasn't in the original, but it could have been. Yeah. Like, yeah. it doesn't feel alien here. Uh, and, and and I really really appreciate a lot of that because it's usually built off some element in the original game. It's yeah. not wholly original, but the way they do it is yeah. original. I, I think a good example of that from remake was Neo Midgar. Mm-hmm. Neo Midgar is one line in the original game. It is mentioned once, and then uh, when you uh, uh, infiltrate the Shinra building, there's like a whole like virtual reality like thing of like explaining what neo midgar is what they want it to be you walk through like a little museum type thing that that example turned up to 11 in rebirth with everything Hmm. it's awesome they really just do cool little things like that which i'll finish my original thoughts real quickly oh go ahead i'm about the music no no this is how these reviews work yeah chains together uh when you find one of these wellsprings you hear the song that plays the very beginning of the original game the before the bombing mission happens it's that those nice soft notes of boom 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 gives you that little mysticism of the world of final fantasy 7 that when you go into these grottos which are even though the tasks themselves are boring looks beautiful because the game also if we didn't touch on this graphically looks extremely pleasing you know, it's got it's photorealistic in this somewhat kind of sense, but also not. So it still feels that detachment from reality that allows for some of the crazier things to happen. I to still look a lot think better. I still think there are times where if you look at some of the finer details, some of the texture work could be better. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, uh, it's a big game with mm-hmm. there's a lot of stuff going on in this game. So I understand if hey, for the purpose of space on your console, we don't want this game to be 300 gigabytes. Uh, yeah, some of these rocks don't look great. Some of these doors don't look great. Um, sometimes from afar, the, some of the character models don't look great, um, especially with some of the like tertiary NPCs, you know, that you find throughout the world. Sometimes they look a little, a little muddy, you know. Mm-hmm. But <laughs> almost not even worth talking about, just because of yeah. how phenomenal everything else is. Yeah, I agree. Which, and one more thing, mm-hmm. maybe not one more thing, who knows. Something that I had a criticism with with the game Octopath Traveler is okay. your party system, they aren't with you. They're just, you know, they all have their own little story going on, and they travel together, but they don't interact with one another. 
This game does like the opposite of that. Not only because they interact with one another, as we previously stated, but when you're in combat, the other party members are there. When you're traveling in the open world, your other party members are there. And going back to the combat, they're actually fighting in that combat. Aerith is launching magic attacks. Barret's shooting things. It doesn't do anything, but it does create that that image of oh, it's not just so much of a video game that you're just getting blinders on. It's a the visual flare for the purpose of a visual flare. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, they're not really doing any real damage. No. If anything, it's like three damage or five. I don't even damage. think they're doing I, that. Uh, yeah, like it's it's nothing. Yeah, but it's nice to have them there, and it's just a nice little little you know little splash of flavor. Yeah. That not many uh, seeing uh, multiplayer them, games do like this. Seeing them run around in the background, seeing them look like they're in the battle does so much for the immersion of the party. You still, f- you feel like the party is a unit. Yeah. Um, and it's it sort of, in the original game, like, you had your three, and you would kind of just kind of stick with your three. For for me, it was Tifa and Barrett. I'd, I'd have Tifa and Barrett for the entire FF7 journey mm-hmm. from beginning to end. Um, I did that still a lot in Rebirth. It was mostly Tifa and Barrett, but I did swap around. I did play around with different mm-hmm. party builds and mechanics and so forth and sometimes the game makes you um but i never had a bad time with any of my combinations which i think is so impressive um it was great playing yuffie it was fun playing red 13 playing Aerith. um the the ways that they expand on old characters and the ways that they introduce new ones um like the idea that in the next game we're gonna get two more is yo what the hell yeah, at least two more, you know? And I I I would like to I would like to open the I I would like to finish off with the, with opening a final conversation with that in how should players approach this game? Because it's a little complicated. Um this game is being advertised uh, as if you could pick this game up as if it was your first one. Uh don't do that. Mm-hmm. Don't do that. Um at least play remake first at least at the very least play remake first um i would recommend playing the whole series uh uh final fantasy final 7. fantasy 7 crisis core remake rebirth watch the watch the advent children movie all of that i think is fun all yep. of that i think is good i've got criticisms of crisis core i don't think it's a, a, a an awesome game advent children as a movie is not very good either uh but the original game really is still awesome um yep. but if it's too old for you, if that's not how you want to be introduced to the world, hey, I wasn't. Remake was my first, you know. Um, I, I still think Remake is a viable way to have your first experience with these games. And if you're not interested in touching the seven game, uh, the original game at all, watch a video on YouTube explaining the plot. You know, like a detailed one. There's tons of detailed ones out there We're, that can supplement that. Yeah, I would do that or play remake first and then get to that ending and be like, what the hell's going on? And then uh, uh, watch a plot recap and, and understand what happens in the original game. Because I also think there are choices made in this game that actively hurt the player's um, relationship with the characters. Mm-hmm. Um specifically Cloud, the way Cloud acts in the last third of this game, I would understand if you finished this game and you were like, yo, I don't I don't fuck with Cloud. I would understand why. Just know that there's a reason for that, and we're just not to that part of the story yet. Um, you're wrong, in other words. But you don't know you're wrong, so it's okay. But it's it's valid. Like, it's va- yeah. like, like, there are times where I go, Cloud, what the fuck, bro? Mm. But I know more than... Uh, a first time player. And if you are a first time player, just 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 stick along with it. Don't don't count him out yet. There's reasons for everything. There are reasons for everything in this game. Um and then let's have a brief conversation about things that are new to the story of Final Fantasy VII. You can speak on this a little bit as well. Uh, and for the, I, I'm putting this at the end for the sake of, hey, if you want to go in blind, spoilers, hey, this is your moment to jump out, to jump out now. Um, we're not going to go deep into spoilers, but we're going to mention characters uh, that, you know, um, have new storylines, we'll say, or have new purpose in, in this game and so forth. Uh, so now is your time to jump out uh, for that. If, if you want to stick around, please, thank you. We're going to talk for probably another, like, I don't know, 15 minutes maybe, uh, and then dip out. 
I loved. So the last game left us with the cliffhanger of like Zach survives. Right. Let's talk about Zach Fair, the, the, the big elephant in the room that is Zach and what's going on with that. I loved his implementation in Rebirth. Even in the ending, when they use him in the ending, I loved that. The, all of the Zach stuff I thought was awesome. Uh, it was great to see this corny ass, <laughs> uh, always positive hero guy be introduced into this world that is so negative. Uh, and sort of how he interacts in this world. Because, like, let's be honest, Zach from Crisis Core fits awkwardly into the world of Final Fantasy VII. Which, going into this game, I was expecting that. Yeah. As far as, and I was, there was and a And it's scene, still there. But in a good way, you know, I, I would say overall. I think in a, in a more acceptable way. Well, there's a scene in one of the, you know, times he's showing up where yeah. there's, Marlene is there. Right, it's yes. his interaction with her, and she's all like dour. And I think there's like two or three scenes of this, but I know which one you're the talking first about. one. Yeah, yeah. Cloud in the first game, they kind of had a weird relationship, and that's understandable because of who Cloud is. Yeah, it wasn't very inviting for a little girl like Marlene. But Zach has one interaction with her, and you, in, she instantly likes the guy. Yeah, because and you see why because he just interjects that that that. Uh, that hero element. He's yeah. the hero, the traditional hero in this world that doesn't usually have one. I mean, you have to remember one of the He's most... very much the, hey, look up. Think about this. Yeah. You know? We're gonna, hey, we're gonna get through this. I'm gonna go do the thing that you want me to do because I'm good and helping yeah. you out. Yeah. But it feels sincere. And It so really does. It does, yeah. It really makes you endeared to that character. And I'll be honest, want. man, I liked the voice acting in this one. See, that's I, the weird thing because... This I, is this is Zach to me now. It is. In seeing Advent Children yeah. and the original Crisis Core, I had liked that voice actor leagues better when I was playing through Crisis Core. And I was like, this guy just doesn't sound all that great for the role. No offense to him. But now I think that's just Crisis Core rather than yeah. the voice actor himself. Because in this one, those Well, even in Crisis better. Core, like, Cloud and Aerith sucked. And those are the same voice actors that we have here who are putting on a clinic. You yeah, know, yeah. like like <laughs> yeah. they're doing great, great work, you know. So I think that I think part of that was Crisis Core. Um, and then his implementation into remake is so small that it's like there's no depth there. Yeah. Um, and he's delivering these iconic lines in ways that aren't um, what we know them to be. Um, but here in Rebirth, I like him. I like I is, is he the best? No. But like he is what Zach needs to be. And this is before we even get a lot of him. You know, yeah. There's gonna be more. I'm assuming. Well, we're gonna, you're gonna have to I'll play have the game and find out, out Connor. No. But I will say that yeah, there are there are moments in here where they pay off on Zach in ways that I dreamed about, and I was like, oh my god, I can't believe this is happening. And I'm assuming that's compounded by the fact that you have now played Crisis Core because we played that a little while. ago. Oh sure, yeah, that yeah, impact, yeah, yeah. That it made him better. Yeah, because if you know where, yeah, he came yeah, from. yeah, you, you, you know, I know who Zach is. I enjoy. Z I, I, that was the thing about Crisis Core is I always liked Zach. Yeah, he was fun. It just was. Yeah, it was the voice acting and the writing that. Yeah, uh, the writing really is fun. awful, but yeah. yeah, the character of Zach. I like Zach's character. You know, I, I, I think it's fun to have that that guy in this story, which is so, so, so sad. Yeah, you know, it's nice to have a guy who's like always looking up. You know, um, because so many of these characters and so much of this world is oppressive. Yeah. You know, and for a guy to just always be looking up is nice, you mm -hmm. know? Um, so yeah, I, I, I think Zach in this game is fantastic. He's just sprinkled throughout it. He's it's it, it it's not his story, it's Cloud's story. Mm -hmm. But you know, they're they're spin they're they're throwing little seeds in there every once in a while. Every once every so often you get a little you know, a little cutaway and it's like, hey, this is what Zach's doing right now, you yeah. know? <laughs> um, it's not as intense as I thought it was going to be. No. From what I've se seen in no. my own playthrough, and I know it's going to be kind of going throughout the rest of the well, game. What you, what you have seen is pretty much we're going to keep doing that. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, he's involved in the ending, you know, yeah. and that's about it. Um, it, it I, I legitimately thought he was going to be half this game. Yeah. And mm -hmm. he's not. He's He's... Not even a quarter, not even, like, he is a very small percentage of this game. You could ignore him, um, which I think is to the benefit of players who this is their first time through Final Fantasy VII, is like, yeah, we cut to this Zack guy. I don't know what the deal is with him, but it's kind of cool or whatever. And they kind of explain why the whole Zack thing at the end of Remake was important. They kind of explain that, but they don't go all the way with it. And uh, much like they don't go all the way with a couple of other things that happen narratively in just the original plot of the game, which is why I 
I, I still think like, hey, go play the original. Like, it's still got a lot of value. It's still really fun and charming. Um, it, it it is old, and you do have to get over that. But like, it is worth it. Mm-hmm. Um, but if this is how you want to experience Final Fantasy VII, I think that's perfectly fine. Uh, I just urge you, urge you, urge you, don't play this one first. Play Remake first. At the very least, play Remake first. For those of you that may have seen the notice that you can play Alan Wake 2 without playing Alan Wake 1, that's true. Not here. Not here. Not yeah, at all. No. Yeah, yeah. you can play Alan Wake 2 without playing Alan Wake 1. Playing Alan Wake 1 helps. Makes it better. It does make it better, you know, because uh, I went and watched a plot recap and I went, oh, that put new meaning on everything. Mm. Um, but it's not necessary, you know? Here, I think it's... I, 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 I don't understand... I understand for marketing reasons. They want the game to sell. It's a big game. They want everybody who can to buy it, and they don't want people to be like, oh, I gotta play the first one first, and then they never get to it. I think just play the first one first. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Connor, is there anything else that we have failed to mention that you wanted to talk about? Not without spoiling. I, I agree. Oh, I, I again, I'll just say, man, character moments in this game are awesome. You know, and I criticize some of, like... Sometimes the animations look a little cheap when you're running through the world or something, but when it's important for that budget to go into specific scenes, they they implement it. Uh, and for fans of the original game, moments that you hope hit, yeah, <laughs> yeah, they fucking hit all of them, every single one of them. Uh, and and so yeah, I'm 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 supremely happy with this game. I've got a couple of problems with it. Um, but when I want to play Final Fantasy VII Remake series as of right now, I'm not going to reach for Remake. I'm going to reach for this game um, because I think this game is better than Remake um, as a whole. Um, I think it, I think Remake is a little tighter of an experience. Rebirth can get a little messy, especially narratively. It's a little messy, but you forgive it because of how high the highs are and how many highs there are. It's constant. There were so many times Connor, like, you know, me and Connor are roommates, so he, there were so many times where he was like, man, I heard you. Were you, like, sneezing? And I was like, no, I was fucking, like, cheering. I was like, mm. yeah! It's happening! Let's go! Like, it, th- this game is, this game really is special. It's really phenomenal, and I I, I love it. Um, it's, it's just these couple of little, like, annoying little issues that I just wish weren't there. And if you know anything about Tavern from these videos, he can be a little bitchy sometimes. So take that with a grain of salt. He can be a whiny little bitch sometimes. And he give me the stink eye. Are you going to end it? Are you going to end it? No, I don't have a button for that. I have to, I have to go over here. But uh, okay. we are, yeah. are going to wrap it up because we have talked for another 50 minutes about Final Fantasy VII, Connor. We, we keep doing this to ourselves. No problem. Yeah. Uh, so... Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for watching and listening. This has been a Two Penny Games review of Final Fantasy VII Rebirth. If you're here from the Gamescast, thank you for sticking around and listening uh, to us rant about how much we love this game. Let us know down in the comments how you felt about the game. And uh, keep an eye out. Make sure you like and subscribe and all that so that you know when this spoiler cast drops. Because we will be going deep and giving theories about where part three is going to go, how we feel about the ending, how we felt about key moments of this game. I'll tell you what, to me, the climax of the game is not where they, the, the devs want the climax to be. It's about five hours earlier, you know? (laughs) So uh, just, you know, that's, that's, that's where I loved the game the most is five hours before the ending (laughs) happened. But Let me know how you felt down in the comments down below. Until next time, have a great time. And Connor, say goodbye to the people. Goodbye.